Here we've got kind of a general knowledge video about how we represent organic molecules or organic structures in different viewpoints. So we do have some basic kind of understanding concepts that go back to simplifications and all that other stuff, uh, which unfortunately are not summarized here. So how do we represent organic molecules? Well, the biggest issue is that these things are tiny, so we can't really see them. However, we could rely on really good spatial artists to take the rules that we've learned from Lewis theory and Vesper and hybridization and molecular orbital theory and then come up with a way to model these things at a much, much larger scale that we could then manipulate by hand and see in three dimensions. And so that's where we end up with model kits. And so there's uh, probably a lot more than three different types, but there's three that I happen to be aware of. Uh, if we look at that first one, it's typically referred to as the HGS model kit. Uh, relatively durable, uh, though a little more on the expensive side. I think I found it retailing for about 20 bucks. Uh, and then there's the Darling model kit. So if you Google these, you should hopefully be able to find them. Uh, the Darling model kit, which is typically the one that I recommend uh, because I am that cheap, its price tag sits at, if you buy the kit, the cheapest kit you can, is $14.75 uh, <clears throat> from them. Uh, the issue with it is it's not quite as durable, but it still does everything that you would need it to, and it's significantly larger than the HGS kit. The HGS kit is relatively tiny, so it, it can be difficult to manipulate or see things uh, at that scale, uh, but it still works. And then the last one, uh, I, I wish I could come up with a name for it, but the only name that I've come up with is the Gray Box Kit. Uh, because as far as I can tell, a bunch of different manufacturers use it, and they all seem to ship it in this kind of gray box. They've got these very large, hard plastic balls, some bonds and all sorts of things like that. This kit seems to be the default for most schools for model kits. Uh, it is exceptionally durable. Uh, it would probably last longer than any of us would ever live. Uh, it's really that durable. Uh, however, it's very difficult, in my opinion, to take it apart or change structures. So it limits kind of its usage in that way. Uh, added to it, it can range in price. I have seen it dip down into the 20s, and I've heard people say that they can get it for 5 or 10, but I've never seen that. So if you really look, you can find that. Um, it usually retails up at $50. Uh, the last time I really kind of poked around it, there was a bookstore that was trying to sell it at like $70 or $80. So that kit, while more durable and may last for a really long time, most students won't need to spend that amount of money to get a good model kit. I still argue that the Darling model is the best, cheap, um, and still does all the same functionality that you would need out of the others. Uh, just realize it's, well, cheap, so it will fall apart on you uh, if you push it to the limits. Uh, <clears throat> the big lessons that we need to remember from chemical bonding. Sigma bonds, okay, which are single bonds, have a direct overlap of the uh, hybridized molecular orbitals, uh, and that overlap will never change until we physically break the bond. This means that I can rotate about a sigma bond without any problems. So all of the model kits will allow for free rotation about a single bond. Uh, pi bonds are an indirect overlap that does change when we rotate about the bond. Okay? And that means that if we have a, a pi bond, we can't rotate, at least not easily. And the model kits all tend to struggle with how they represent pi bonds. And unfortunately, there really isn't a, a lot we can really do with that. They can do static pi bonds fine, but if you start to kind of level up into doing reactions, it requires too much changing of the structure to do anything really useful with. Uh, and then other little parts that come into play. Electronegativity determines the balance of the bond charge. So the more electronegative atom in a bond would become more negative, the less electronegative becomes more positive. So if we have a three-dimensional model, we can start to see where those charges distribute through the structure and potentially cancel each other out or contribute to a net dipole. So the model can help us see and visualize that much cleaner 
than say if we just drew it out on paper. Uh, and then finally we've got the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory which is our way to explain how the shapes exist. Okay? Uh, thankfully the, the whole shape aspect as far as the model is already built into the model kits. So if you're using the model kits appropriately you don't have to worry about well where, do every, where does everything go because the models are designed to only allow you those distinct shapes. Okay, so those can help us out. So uh, a couple things kind of come up with this. Models help with the three-dimensional aspect of how we visualize and see it. Unfortunately, all tests that you're ever going to take and probably ever going to take in an organic chemistry class are in two dimensions. Okay, so you'll run into different instructors that will say you should buy a model kit, but then you can't use it on the exam, and so most students just don't buy it. Okay, uh, at least for yours truly, I will allow you to use a model kit on an exam in the hopes that you start using the model kit outside of the class. The theory being is you use it outside of the class and you realize you don't need it anymore and you don't use it on the exam. Okay? So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, if you will. They are insanely useful. Most students I found cannot see these things in three dimensions and need to use a model kit. It takes a little bit of practice, so get used to manipulating them. Okay? That said, we now need to move into what we would then do with our two-dimensional drawings. So hopefully we could use the model kit as we're moving through this video, building the model, and then saying, okay, well, what is Mike telling me to do uh, with how I'm looking at the model to get to my individual drawing? Okay? So here are different types of two-dimensional drawings that are typically used in organic chemistry. We have our Vesper or our line angle drawings. These are the standard default that you've seen everywhere. Okay? They're ubiquitous. Uh, after that, we'd move into a seesaw. Uh, I tend to not reference this as a distinct drawing model, but it does kind of pop up. It's really taking the line angle drawing and transitioning it or starting the motion to the Newman projection uh, while using the model kit. Because it's a transitional one, I tend to ignore it. You'll see it in your textbook a lot because they're trying to help you visualize that transition. If you've got the model kit, you don't need to worry about the seesaw because the model kit allows you to transition between them. Um, the Newman projection is the end-on view um, and primarily used for energy difference. So your Vesper or line angle is really kind of a side, okay? uh, a side angle of, the, of your molecule. Whereas your Newman is really now taking that molecule and looking at, at the end of it, if you will. Okay. Uh, the overhead <coughs> drawings are very similar to line angle, but they're pretty much exclusively for your ring structures. Okay. As soon as we form a ring, it's very hard to say where do we have a side and where do we have a top and a bottom and all of that. Okay, so we run into some kind of weird issues that pop out of the uh, ring structures. The primary one is our overhead, which keeps things nice and simple. Very, very similar to our lining. Kind of the default, again, uh, for rings. After that, we can then start to look at it and say, well, what happens if we bring in rotations of bonds and things like that? And that's where we end up seeing chairs, which are the primary category, but then you'll hear other types of two-dimensional drawings of boats and twists and envelopes and all sorts of other fun stuff. We'll look at a couple of those. These are really a partial side view of rings in the line angle format. So we're taking our overhead view and then we turn it on its side. Okay? So you get a slightly different view of the model. We then run into the Hayworth, which I may be spelling wrong. There may be a Y in there. I can't remember. Um, so someone can yell at me about that later. Uh, it's very similar to the overhead view uh, and similar to the chair in some respect. The chairs take into account the bond angles. Hayworth says no bond angles, don't do that. Just take your overhead view and turn it on its side. Okay? Um, sort of, so at a partial side view. And this changes again our viewpoint and allows us to see different parts of the model a little bit differently. And then finally we have the Fisher projection or the Fisher drawing uh, model. Uh, in my opinion, it is a very, very weird view, uh, but it is exceptionally useful if you had a molecule with several chiral atoms. Okay? 
Uh, typically where you see Fisher projections pop up is for, say, biochemistry when you're looking at carbohydrates or other kind of biological molecules because there's tons of chiral atoms uh, and, well, quite frankly, biologists want things simplified and they don't want to look at the structure. So they simplify it down and just say, well, Fisher has organized all these rules, we can just look at the end result. Okay? Um, it's still useful, but it's kind of difficult to get there. So one of the questions may pop up is, well, why? Why do, why do we need all these different drawings? Why do we have to look at models? Okay, well, hopefully what we might recognize here is a picture of a monkey. Uh, and if you had a good childhood, or not, I mean, it depends, you might recognize this as Curious George. Okay, well, Curious George goes on a bunch of different adventures, and sometimes he turns. Okay, well, this is still Curious George, but now he's standing. Right? We still call him Curious George. This isn't Curious George standing now. Okay? Uh, it's, he still holds the same name, but he looks different. He's drawn differently. So we need to be aware of that manipulation. Okay? Further, what if he turned the other direction? Well, crap, now it's Curious George standing, but the left side of his face, not the right side of his face. Okay? We have to be very, very uh, kind of careful when we're looking at organic molecules to realize that these are not two-dimensional. These are three-dimensional objects that don't change their identity because of our drawings. Okay? They still must be the same thing. So we have to be able to visualize and say, what are these mutations or permutations we're making on the model models, uh, and does that actually change the structure or not? Because sometimes it does. Okay? Sometimes in organic chemistry, we come through and say, you know what, Curious George? I think it is better if you have a robotic leg because you need spider legs, because spider legs allow you to climb walls. Okay? That, that's okay. okay. So we need to be able to say, well, spider leg Curious George is different from regular Curious George. Okay? And that, <coughs> sorry about that, comes back to classifying a pair of molecules. So we have this massive flow chart, and it's not that massive, but a, a flow chart that allows us to compare between structures and say, well, what are we getting to in each of these cases? So if we start with two molecules, we can then ask ourselves a question, and the answer to that question leads us to describing the relationship between them. Okay? So in the case of the Curious George thing, we'd be constantly moving down towards identical until maybe we put on spider legs, in which case uh, it's definitely not identical. He has different pieces. He would be a different Curious George. Okay? So it's a question of looking at those pieces and then subdividing them out into their different categories. And so all of these things we could come up with separate definitions for, but really it makes the most sense to follow a flowchart. Get used to interpreting this. Get used to the terms that show up on it. You will see them again and again and again. <clears throat> I will say that probably the most difficult for students to nail down is getting all the way to this mirror images question at the very end. Okay? Because what if we turn the structure upside down? Okay? It may not look like a mirror image, but if I turn it back over, it is. So I have to be very, very careful with the permutations in three-dimensional space to make sure that I don't misapply some of these rules. Okay? So let's start really, really simple. Ethane. Okay? And if we've done our nomenclature homework, we should be able to say that ethane has two carbons <clears throat> fully saturated with hydrogens, and we could draw out a nice, pretty Lewis structure. Okay, well, I didn't want the Lewis structure. I actually wanted the Vesper structure, or the uh, line angle. Okay, so within this, what I want to do is start simplifying it uh, to the side view for our line angle, where the carbon bonds make up the backbone, Okay, and then I can add in wedges and dashes to specify some three-dimensional characteristics of my structure. How do I know which to make wedges and dashes? <clears throat> well, play with the model kit and you'll establish how to go through and do this. Okay, for instance, if you're playing with the model kit, let's take a look at this side of the structure. Will you ever be able to arrange the model in such a way that our carbon-carbon bond, our carbon-hydrogen bond, are in the same plane, and we have a dashed hydrogen going away from you, and a 
uh, going away from you in the up direction and a wedged hydrogen going away from you or going towards you in the down direction. And what you'll find is you will have a very, very hard time adjusting the molecule to get this to be true. Okay? So that is technically a bad way to represent the structure because we can't physically get the three-dimensional model into this position. Okay? So when it comes to drawing out your VSEPR models, what I would recommend you do is focus on it on being two triangles. Okay? We have two solid lines in a triangle. The other two bonds must be in a triangle aimed the other direction. Okay? So they will both will point, I guess, at the center carbon. And you'll notice that the two strongs I have set up are not the same. Okay? I had, whoops, let's not look at that one. I had a subtle rotation about one of those bonds, and yet still I have the two points aimed at each other. Okay? This should <clears throat> man, this should ensure that I get the proper drawing and the proper representation, particularly if you say had an online homework system that is picky about how things get drawn. Okay. So these are two possible ways that if you looked at your model kit that you would be able to draw. So ideally you spend a minute here, have the model kit of ethane, and spin it and adjust it so that both of these models or both of these representations are visible. Okay. So this would be like if Curious George spun his head backwards okay, or turned his head. We get a slightly different viewpoint. Okay, well now, what happens once we move out of the kind of standard format? Okay, well, the seesaw model says that we're going to take our model and we're going to bring, in this case, <clears throat> notice I'm drawing the eye. The eye is kind of my vantage point on this. I'm going to take this leftmost structure and I'm going to take that leftmost carbon of that structure and I'm going to grab it and pull it out of the board towards me okay, or towards you as the viewer. And then I'm going to pull it a little bit down. This will allow me to see all of the atoms, but in a slightly different view. Hopefully what you'll see would be something along these lines. Okay, and we now have a different viewpoint of our structure. Okay, this is the seesaw model. <clears throat> what happens if instead of bringing that carbon down, I'd actually kept it level and overlapped it with the other carbon? Okay. Well, this is the Newman projection. So I end up moving that left carbon up and over until the carbon-carbon bond in ethane disappears, is no longer visible to me. Okay? And if we were to try and draw that out, that gets a bit weird, because I've got a carbon okay, with my hydrogens, and then if I were to draw the back carbon as being purple, I would have a carbon with hydrogens, and then it would be really difficult to see, particularly if you didn't have colors, which atom was what. Okay? So Newman took this into consideration and said, let's make some adjustments. So adjustment number one, the carbon in front will be implied as a point. Okay. Adjustment number two, the carbon atom in back will become implied as a really big point, i.e. a circle. Okay. And then what we'll do is in this formation or the angle that we've got set up here, yes, it's buried that hydrogen, but I will kind of draw it just slightly askew so that I can see it out there, so that I know that, yes, there's another hydrogen there. And I now have a new viewpoint. This is kind of like a reverse perspective, because the front atom ends up getting drawn tiny, and the back atom gets drawn really, really big. This allows us to still see all of those connections and allows us to manipulate the structure. And what we should end up with is seeing two different structures, or two different possibilities, coming from the original Vesper models, okay, which is kind of neat. The interesting thing of this is if we have these two models, is there a difference between these structures? Then hopefully that difference becomes more apparent and you'll be able to answer it in a quiz question that pops up here or that you'll see the answer to in class. What happens when we move up to the cycloalkanes? Well, when we hit the cycloalkanes, we're now again putting in a restriction on our structure. If we have a cyclopropane, we can't rotate the bonds anymore without breaking the sigma bonds to get a rotation about them. So the ring tends to prevent rotation. 
So because of that, we're starting at the cyclopropane, we could then go through and draw an overhead view, where again, what we're trying to do is keep all of the carbons drawn in the same plane, so that we can draw solid lines, because that's our main chain. And as we scale up and add more and more carbons in, one of the things that starts to happen is that we allow for some rotation. That some rotation is what really brings in the other shapes that we're used to seeing with our ring structures. If we wanted to, we could still layer in the Vesper wedge dash. So if I went back to that propane, or the cyclopropane, I could go through and say that these hydrogens were wedged and dashed, where the wedge is coming out at us and the dash is going away. If you're going to attempt to build a model, do not build a model for the cyclopropane. Okay? It will undoubtedly break your model kit. Okay? The bond angles are too tight. So if you want to build one, you can. You can probably get away with the cyclobutane. Uh, I think only the gray box kit can build the cyclopropane, and even that, it, it, it's pretty, pretty gnarly on. Okay? So that's our overhead view. We're just looking at it from the top, and if we wanted to, sometimes we do, we'll add wedges and dashes to imply the spatial uh, relationship of those groups back to our center ring. Okay? Uh, what happens when we have pentanes and hexanes? So again, I'd like you to take a minute here and build a cyclopentane, and build a cyclohexane. Okay? And look at, get that built, and then turn it on its side, and attempt to draw it from the side. Okay? Rotate some bonds, and see if your structural viewpoint changes. And hopefully what you'll notice is that we end up on that side view with two possible representations. We have the envelope representation for our cyclopentane, okay? and this is because we're tetrahedral carbons. They want to be 109.5 degrees. So if we can, the structure will pucker and allow for that to happen. Okay? Same deal, we get something similar for our cyclohexane, and we get our chair. So some people have a hard time seeing this, so let's look at some examples. Well, there's an example of an envelope. Okay? We have the, whoops, we have the base of our envelope, okay? and then we have the flap of the envelope that could then theoretically be folded over to seal our envelope. Okay? So our cyclopentanes have this envelope view. The chairs become significantly harder to see because really you can see a chair from any given angle uh, if your model is set right, and that becomes challenging. You may likely, when you built your cyclohexane, you probably actually built the boat form and not a chair. So see if you can't twist it into this chair formation. And now see if you can't twist it into the chair formation. Okay. When we actually see where the chair is, where our back sits, or our back rests, where our legs rest, and then where our feet rest. Okay, so we're sitting in a, a lawn chair, kind of facing that direction. Neat. Okay. Were there other ways that we could look at these? Okay, well, the envelope, I could have grabbed that carbon of my envelope and I could have pulled it straight downwards, so it would have gone through a, a single bond rotation, in which case it would have looked like that. Okay. Arguably not as pretty, but that's fine. Could I have done a similar thing with the chair? Okay, well, I could have taken the back of the chair, where I put my head, and I could have pulled that down. Okay, this would take me to the, what I like to say, is the upside-down boat, okay, or capsized boat. But then if I follow that by taking my old footrest and rotating that upwards, I would then form a new headrest, and I'd have this conformation, okay, which is now my lawn chair, However, my lawn chair is now facing the other direction. Okay? So what we're doing is doing some simple single bond rotations. In the case of the chair, what we're doing is what's known as a chair flip. Okay? So drawing chairs. This is a fun little one. Okay? Ideally, what I would do is focus on kind of a center line, and I would draw two lines that are staggered across that line, okay? slightly angled. Okay? So one line is longer than the other. Ideally, that would have been through the center. But that didn't work out. Longer on one side than the other. Okay. So then what I'll do is pick the left or right side. doesn't really matter. And I'll start with the short line. So if I'm going to start here, 
the short line is the one on top. Okay? And I'm going to draw up or down depending on if that line is on top or on the bottom. Okay? Well, that line is on top, so I'm going to go up. Okay? Now that I've done that, I can go through, oops, I don't have an orange. Let's get an orange color in there, and I can complete that side of it. Okay? What do I do? On the other side, I do the same thing. I pick the shortest line, which will be this one. I'll aim down, and then I'll connect my triangle. And I now have my chair facing towards my right. Okay, what if I wanted my chair to face the other direction? Okay, well, I would then slope the lines the other direction. I do something like this. Up, down, and then down, up. And now my chair is facing the other direction. It takes a little bit of practice to get used to drawing chairs. I would highly recommend and encourage you to do so. For those of you that have not seen the chair yet, okay, by playing around with the model kit, that takes a little bit of practice. You might want to talk to somebody who has found uh, the visual for the chair. Okay. Um, now we then run into what happens with our chair flip. So if we took a look at a chair flip for the structure here, most students go through and draw something like this. Okay, so what they're saying is that we looked at the kind of axis coming out at you. We can draw that wedged, and we just spun the at, or spun the chair around. Okay, well, this isn't going to be a good chair flip because if our dude was sitting in that little chair, he has a very odd shape. Uh, he is now flipped upside down on the grass, okay, uh, which is not nice. Okay? Ideally, we'd be sitting on the chair. So what we're talking about with a chair flip is that we want to adjust the back and the, where's my button? Um, the back and the feet of the chair so that my dude would then just have to get up and turn to face the other direction, okay? This way, he's still sitting in the chair. He did have to get up, but he's no longer underneath the chair, okay? This is now a proper chair flip, okay? And what you should notice if you're using the model kit is that when we do this, this atom that was E this is where it's aimed. It's kind of aimed out away from the structure. Okay? And the atom A is kind of aimed down underneath the structure. When we do the chair flip, what happened to atom E? Atom E is now aimed up above the structure, and atom A is aimed out away from the structure. So the chair flip changes the relative location of the atoms back to, to the chair. That's kind of an interesting feature. If we have a different arrangement in space, would that change the energy? Okay. Well, think about your instructor. Okay. They're standing in front of you, talking to you. Uh, and now, instead of standing in front of you, talking next to you, they are sitting in your lap and shouting in your face. Does the spatial arrangement between the atoms relative to different positions make a difference in the energy? At least I personally, as an instructor, would say yes. Yes, that would be very weird. I don't want to do that. Okay? So if this is going to change the energy, I need a better visualization. What's the better visualization for energy? Oh, crap. That was my Newman projections. So what I can do is scale my Newman projections and do that with the chair as well. Okay? So if we've got the chair drawn in the lower left, we're actually sighting down two bonds to draw the Newman projection shown. So we have two Newman projections linked to each other through those CH2 bridges, okay? Where the one up here would be where my headrest was of my chair, and the one down here is where my feet would be on the chair, okay? This can allow me a better vantage point of those E and A atoms when placed into the structure, and I can start to see what happens during chair flips. Okay? This can bring in some context of the energy changes, which are super important and we need to be aware of when looking at structures. Okay? The last two structures that we'll look at, which I'm not going to be able to do in 30 seconds, but I'm going to try and do as fast as I can, the Hayworth projection has a relatively minor contribution to our class. If we looked at our chairs, we had the overhead 2D view, we kind of had the chair, which is sort of a 3D side view. We have the Newman projection, which is a 3D end view. Okay, well, what is the Hayworth? 
Well, the Hayworth is kind of a two-dimensional side view. So we're taking the overhead drawing, and we're turning it on its side, but we're assuming it stays flat, which isn't true. It forms a chair. Okay? So Hayworth just wanted to simplify and remove that chair information, and by doing so, it simplifies the drawing, and we can get a better context, or sometimes an easier context, of this up-down respect of those bonds. Okay. This says nothing about what's going on with the atoms E and A that I had labeled over here, conveniently labeled as E and A, as we'll find in class. Okay. Where this comes in uh, majorly is with biochemistry when we're looking at carbohydrates. So we've got two uh, saccharides linked to each other to form uh, a polysaccharide, which is then drawn as such. So we can get a relationship between these. Okay? Some of those important relationships being, well, this oxygen is downwards in comparison to this CH2OH. Okay, so why is that relevant? Well, if it was aimed upwards, we'd name it something else. Okay? So we can use the Hayworth projection to help us classify and name our carbohydrates. So if you've heard of alpha or beta or D or L carbohydrates, it's coming back to kind of the Hayworth projection and seeing how those things are oriented relative to each other. Okay, uh, and then I got to pause here for a second. Hopefully I did that right. Speaking of carbohydrates, we have our last type of drawing, the Fisher projection. A biochemist was working with carbohydrates and noted uh, that the massive amount of stereocenters made it very difficult to draw and look at these structures. So our stereocenter is a carbon with four um, different things. I don't know why I said four plus, but four different things attached to it. So if we go through and look at the structure drawn, uh, these carbons all have four distinguishable groups attached to them. And so because of it, they have this special arrangement or special chemistry associated with them. Uh, and so what Fisher did was took that structure as drawn as our standard Vesper structure and turned it into what we see on the right. Okay, you might say, well, why would we do that? Well, there's some information that comes out of the structure on the right that simplifies our interpretation and can make life a little bit easier. Um, however, we have to get there first. Okay, so how do we get there from the line angle? So here are some rules. We must orient the carbon chain on the vertical axis and always away. So that means every time you look at a carbon, uh, the carbon chain then goes away from you. The highest priority carbon uh, is defined to be at the top of the uh, Fisher projection. Okay? The priority is assigned according to the Kahn-Ingold pre-log rules. And you're like, well, what are those? Don't worry about it yet. We will figure that out in a little bit or some other later time. And then the last part, substituents will then aim towards the observer, wedged to the left and to the right. So if we go ahead and take the structure as drawn, you'll notice that uh, our very first step has kind of been set up away for us because we have the carbon chain aimed on the vertical axis. However, uh, the carbons must always be away from us. So what we're going to do is kind of look at this position. Uh, actually, not even quite there. We want to set this up so that the carbons are all on the exact same line. Okay, so they're still zigzagged. So what we're going to do is take our eyeball and we're going to kind of view from the side here. Okay. If we go through and do that, what we'll end up with is the drawing as such. Okay. Our very first carbon, or second carbon, here, has the carbon backbone kind of going away from it if, our again, our viewer is coming in from this angle. Uh, if we moved the next carbon in the chain and then kind of looked down here, we'd notice that the carbon backbone is kind of aimed at us from that carbon. And we move down to this one, and then to this one, uh, and then we don't worry about the last one because it's not a carbal atom. Okay? And we would end up with a rough approximation of the drawing shown. Okay? Again, the carbon chain must always be aimed away. Well, the first carbon was fine, the second carbon doesn't have the carbon chain aimed away. So what we would have to do is rotate about the single bonds to get that to align. Okay? So if we did that rotation, we'll notice the OH then switches sides okay, to be aimed at us. 
The next position would already be set. We don't have to touch it. So it's left alone. And then the last one, we'd need a rotation. And that's what we'd end up with. We're now in what is the Fisher projection. Since we are now by definition in that position, I can imply all the dashes and wedges, and I end up with exactly what Fisher drew on the far right. Okay. Again, this does have some useful applications. Uh, it's just not super apparent, say, right now. What I think makes this even more interesting is that if we stepwise went through and did this appropriately and then looked at the model kit from the side view again, it looks like this, okay? where our structure is actually spiraling in on itself. And as we continue to add more carbons, we'd be spiraling further and further away, okay? where this one is close to us and this one is far away. Okay? Again, why? Well, having that straight chain can make things a little bit easier to interpret. And so biochemists tend to favor that method over looking at, um, say, a real structure. Okay. Yes, that was an intentional dig. And with that, we have the end of the video. Okay. So thanks for watching. Hopefully that made sense to you. You can always ask questions later.